What is it about English folk music in particular that makes you want to play it? Um, that's a difficult question. I think it's because I'm English <laughs> <laughs> and I like folk music and if I wasn't English and was from a different country I'd play that folk music. Um, I do think it's got some... All folk musics have the same attitude. I think they all come from the same attitude of kind of, you know, it's functional music, it's for it is to cover every aspect of entertainment and it has to be something that people can do themselves as well as the modern sort of folk thing which is to go to concerts and, and you know, pay to see it which is it's, that's folk music I know I do it for a living but it's folk music out of its natural environment it's like going to a zoo to right. watch animals rather than going to the wild to watch animals and the same with animals but um, uh, uh, it's sort of more at home pubs and, and around yeah, people would have done it at home a lot more when there was no telly as well. But, um, uh, so that's the attitude side, and I really like that because it means you cover all things from incredibly sort of sensitive lyrics to um, very sort of rough dance music, and it's the rough dance music that really got me into to it. But you can find examples of that in every every type of folk music I've ever encountered. The things that make it particularly English are just sort of it's, it is to do, the dance tunes are to do with the way that English people traditionally danced. Obviously, she's pretty sort of vertical dancing rather than horizontal dancing. I don't mean lying down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can take, take fast moving folk dances that people take short steps off the ground mm. to cover a large distance. So they're going you know, along. Um, whereas English, a lot of southern English dancing anyway is, is much more about height off the ground and jumping and athletics and you find very similar sort of techniques employed in any folk music that has that interest in I love there's a one in um, Norway called, uh, what's it called, Halling, uh, uh, Halling that they do there, I've, I've, I've got to see a stage there, but it's, it's a really bouncy dance that they've got and you find mm -hmm. very similar little turns in music that bring that out. So. I play English music because I'm English, it's the answer. <laughs> the thing was, <laughs> we, we, we like playing stuff, from, we started up, when we started off as the duo, before we recorded anything, we hadn't even decided whether we were going to do just English stuff or uh, what bit of the session repertoire we were going to do, I and mean, the sessions we play, we play Irish tunes, Canadian tunes, um, so I suppose we're playing one, yeah, there's two, two on there that there's the Hungarian tune and three tunes and there's um, Mary and she's Canadian but well, the way we play that Hungarian tune you'd sort of struggle to know it was Hungarian um, it, it's a very stumpy tune and again that's quite nice to find similarities in in, in, um, in, in cultures and, and how the folk music is kind of converge in some places but if we play it, then it's going to end up not, it's going to sound like classic, it won't sound like the tradition it comes from. You're not very good in the mix of Irish, but well, I'm certainly not, John's quite a good Irish fiddler, but I, I can't make my melodian sound Irish for Toffee. And, but yeah, some, I think we actually uh, did um, a tune set on rough music with Eliza um, called Mr. Mr. McCuskers and Mr. McGoldrick's English Choice, um, which was they're very nice tunes, Englished up, which I'm sure they didn't approve of, but um, it was quite fun to sort of actually deliberately making a tune more English than it really is. So how were you first exposed to folk music? Uh, folk music, um, I don't really remember the exact time I was exposed to it, but my dad's a Morris dancer, he's been uh, at the festival with his team, having been traditionally Morris one in the club. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I was taken and dumped in the corner of pubs, pub gardens in, from about this time of year, May, uh, March, April, May, all the way through to the end of summer, um, and <laughs> left to my own devices with a packet of cheese and onion crisps um, and a, cherry, a bottle of cherry eggs, and it was going on over there, and that's where we went out on weekends um, and uh, that would do his dancing on would watch and we play around outside and I, did, I really didn't pay much attention to it. I used to watch it sometimes. I think there was a period of time when I learned to play the recorder at school and I learned the tunes by ear and played 
that my first time playing folk music was playing Socolino recorder at the Oxford University Morris Man, aged about eight or something like that. But, um, uh, but I think it probably it's one of those things that everyone has a very very early influence in folk music. I only discovered that recently, but basically English folk music. Has is an unbroken tradition as far as very small children are concerned. Mm -hmm. Nursery rhymes are basically the last bit that has that never died out, and no one ever considered a strange thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, and with the rest of folk music, basically, it's um, along the lines of nursery rhymes for adults. And I don't know why. Um, it's possibly because it's so associated with nursery rhymes, that kind of melody structure and the simplicity of it that people think, well, I've grown up and I've got to do something else. Mm. Um, and I think everyone goes through that a bit. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I didn't pay much attention to it and, and it's very easy to remember the kind of music. So I had my whole teenage years of, of not doing it and vaguely knowing about it and being embarrassed when I came back to it afterwards. On Vagabond, um, mm. there's one tune that you introduced saying that you found it on the internet. Yes. Um, so how do you find just tunes and songs? On the internet? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, very rare we find tunes on the internet, that was, that was a specific kind of thing and it just turned out that that tune uh, that I found with the title that was appropriate to the album was also a pretty good tune and, and I, 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 very rare that you should do things. You have to search for the tune title for a start, so if you don't know the tune then how, what good's that? <laughs> mm. um, no, I tend to nick it off other people playing it. Um, that's, Way. And if I hear someone playing a tune that's really good, I'll go for it. I do occasionally try it. I mean, I, I'm one of the worst readers of written manuscript. Lazy, um, slightly dyslexic, uh, just can't do it. <laughs> but I do have music books that, um, if I know what that, that it's likely to be something good in there, then I'll plow through and learn it note by note. And uh, then I've hundreds of tunes that I instantly forget after learning it by ear. You know, that's when you really wish that you could read music, is to be able to scan through tune books and find the good ones. But then again, you only play stuff when you find a new angle on, on the tune. Um, so often what we started off doing was taking the tunes that everyone had. You can't play that in a club performance. That's been done to death. Mm -hmm. We just go, well, let's see if we can find something else in it then. Let's see if we can surprise people because they expect to hear it. An example of that would be? Uh, on through and through, um, doing the Quaker and Brighton camp, three and a half, three, they're just they're the holiest of English session tunes. And obviously, great, more than that, are great tunes, but they've been done a lot as well. And that pairing, I was just trying to find find as much in the tunes as we could with the arrangements. That's sort of how the Spires and Bone sound was to start with, we'd look for something to see, we almost did um, the Wild Rover, just to, to you know, it's like a challenge, see if you can find something new in, in that that people like, and then Paul Sartin beat us to it, because he's got a version on it um, uh, that's uh, English and very, very lyrical, and it doesn't sound anything like the one that people think of as the same story. Are there songs and, and tunes that uh, you'd like to do, but then someone else has done it so well you uh, don't? Well, there has been that, yes. Um, and, well, you know, uh, not mentioning any names, but we've, we've <laughs> we, sometimes the tunes are ideas that go round, especially when we're starting out, we just used to be session monkeys and we go to every session we possibly could all the time. And these ideas can go, get out and you never know who had them in the first place. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't normally. You would normally let someone have done it about two years before on the recording before you go and record it again. But uh, there've been a few like we've, we didn't know that Crucible were going to release um, uh, Banks the Doom. I think on those, and we did tunes and and there was a few tunes that have obviously come to the surface and we hadn't checked with them and we were doing on their album and had that with. Uh, well, some of our early albums and Waters and Cuffy we were going to do one then with their album came out we went, oh, oh we've got to take it off we've got to so we'll do that one on our next one I think 